welcome to our Fall Women's Leadership Forum titled Utah Women in 2020, Challenges, Opportunities, and Next Steps. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, founding director of the Utah Women in Leadership Project and also the Karen Haight Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. I am the host today and will be the panel moderator. This event furthers the mission of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. We serve Utah and its residents by first, producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research. Second, creating and gathering valuable resources. And third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And I'd like to thank our sponsors, the John M. Huntsman School of Business and also the Utah Education Network for making this event possible. So first I would like to have Kelsey Emery who is a graduate research assistant for the UWLP and also Kylie Downs who's the program assistant for the Utah Women in Leadership Project as well. And they will introduce our panelists today, Kelsey. All right, so first I'm going to introduce Liz Owens. She is a womanist, feminist, multiracial, multicultural woman of color from Utah. She serves as a community educator, gender justice and racial justice activist. Liz has experience working on issues that disproportionately impact women and with historically underrepresented individuals and communities. She currently serves as the CEO of the YWCA Utah where she leads the organization in meeting their mission of eliminating racism, empowering women, and promoting peace, justice, freedom, and dignity for all. Liz grew up in Provo, Utah, and once walked the last 100 kilometers of the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Liz and her partner, Brad, are the proud and devoted parents to a little human named Fox, and pet parents to two doggies, Flynn and Fia. Thanks for being here, Liz. Thanks, um, thanks Kelsey. I'd like to welcome Becky Jacobs. <clears throat> Becky Jacobs is a reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune who covers women's issues and the status of women in Utah. She started at the paper in June 2019 through Report for America, an organization focused on eliminating the country's news deserts. She wrote a series of articles from a first of its kind poll of Utah women conducted by the Salt Lake Tribune and Suffolk University, examining how women in the state view themselves and what they perceive their biggest challenges to be. In the past year, she spotlighted 139 new female voices in the Tribune. Becky previously reported for the Post Tribune in Northwest Indiana and for the Grand Forks Herald in North Dakota. Welcome, Becky. All right. And then Robin Schribner is a research fellow for the Utah Women and Leadership Project at Utah State University. She has been the team lead for the Utah Women's Stats Research Snapshot Series, where she has co-authored 16 snapshots on various topics of interest to Utah women, including poverty, labor force participation, domestic violence, and the gender wage gap. During her time with the UWLP, she has contributed to dozens of other reports and articles focused on supporting and advancing women and girls. Robin is active in community outreach, frequently speaking and presenting on women's issues in various settings. She has a special interest in women's labor force participation, highlighting the challenges that women face when they're trying to balance work and family responsibilities while advocating for creative solutions to advance women's professional well being. So thanks, uh, I'll be moderating the panel discussion today and I have many questions that I'll ask, but we'll also be working in questions from the chat throughout the discussion today. So submit your questions anytime in the Q&A or chat and the panelists and I will be watching and answering as we can, but make sure you post to all attendees, not just the panelists, so that other folks can learn from the comments and the discussions there as well. So I will start each uh, the, with the first question, and that is, I love this question, by the way. That is, why is each of you and your organizations so passionate about this topic? And Robin, I wanna start with you as we move forward. I'd like to have you get, get this started. Okay, thank you so much. It's so great to be here today, and I'm excited to hear from Liz and Becky and all of us as we have this fantastic conversation. Um, so every time I get asked this question, I think it, many women who are do this kind of work have a similar answer that we uh, that we just kind of have this innate sense that everybody deserves a fair shake, that that all of us are equal and all of us deserve the opportunities and and respect and things that we would love to have as 
fellow humans in this world, right? And so um, I, I, that's me. I've always been interested in women. That, that led me to work with you, Susan, about five years ago at the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And I realized when I was filling out that job application for you, I looked back over my master's thesis. I looked back over my undergraduate thesis and the big papers that I'd written. And I realized I have always studied women. That is that has always been the most fascinating topic for me and the types of challenges that we have. And so um, I have always been particularly interested in women's careers. They have twists and turns that men's careers don't often have. So um, so that's been a passion of mine and something that I that I know I'll work on for the rest of my life. So in terms of my organization, I, I'm still a research fellow with the Utah Women in Leadership Project. And, and over the last five years, I have learned the power of research and data and, and that it is absolutely fundamental to making a difference in the problems that we need to solve in this world. I was having a chat, a family chat the other day and my stinky brother was uh, talking about some big project going on and he said, they had all this money and, and believe it or not, they actually used it to do something instead of just launching a study. And I called him and I said, studies do something, studies matter. Studies are how we decide what needs to be done and if the things that we're already doing are working or not. So I really called him on that and, and I, uh, I believe <laughs> passionately in the in the power of research and the work that we're all doing. So that's what I'd love to say about that question. Thank you so much. Liz. Hey, let me just unmute. Uh, hello. Thanks. It's great to be here. I, I mean, definitely Robin's story and what brings her to this work resonates with me as well. Um, as a woman of color who lives and works in Utah, uh, you know, women's well-being is personal to me. It's, it's, it has to do with my own experience. And I also think that it should be personal to everyone. Um, I think that many of our society's greatest challenges can be addressed in part through achieving greater gender and racial equity. Uh, I think designing our policies and services by centering experiences of those most marginalized, and in the case of women, centering the experiences of BIPOC women, Black, Indigenous, and uh, women of color, uh, in particular, will most effectively address the well-being of all women and children and communities in Utah. I focused my own career and volunteer endeavors on gender and racial justice because I believe that so strongly. Uh, and as an organization, YWCA Utah has been serving women for over 114 years. And today we are Utah's most comprehensive provider of family violence services. Our programs include walk-in services. We have a crisis line, emergency shelter, transitional housing, um, children's programming, uh, and a vast array of supportive services. But I think what's most extraordinary is the many ways our organization meets our powerful mission. I think many people uh, know, but maybe some of you don't know, I've been in position officially um, as CEO for six months now. Uh, and what has really struck me is the many ways in which we attend to meeting our mission and our mission is to eliminate racism and empower women. So that includes a nationally accredited child care and early education center. We have leadership opportunities for women um, and other opportunities for women to participate more fully in civic life like Real Women Run at YWCA. Uh, we also have race equity programming like Woke Words and our 21 day challenge. Uh, we meet our mission in a multitude of ways because it takes diverse actions and programs to address gender and racial inequity. And I and I do remember that didn't you start like the week of the COVID? I mean, it was like right at the beginning. Uh, it was the second week of the lockdown. So oh. and so much has happened that has really brought our uh, work and our mission to the forefront of what's happening in our country, to women uh, in regards to race. So, um, and I'm really excited to talk more about that today. Great, thank you. Becky. Well, thanks. I'm honored to be on a panel with three sources I call all the time. Um, I feel lucky because I usually go to them for answers and explanations, but um, I think they've prepared me pretty well. I've been at the Tribune for over a year now and to specifically cover women's issues and the status of women in Utah. And that's not a, paper, a position that existed at the paper before I started. Um, they made a conscious effort that this is something they wanted to cover. And so I feel really lucky that I get to be the one to explore that. Um, personally, it's been interesting because I'm 28 years old. So as I talk to Susan and others about like education and things in the workforce, I think about it 
applied to my life too, as I'm writing about the lives of Utah women. And it's also been interesting to learn about the unique challenges in Utah coming from someone who's from the Midwest. I think it helps bring perspective, but I'm also opening my eyes to um, something new here. And I think there's just a, a bigger interest right now for um, reporting related to gender. There's a new nonprofit organization called the 19th and they focus on um, policy and politics related to gender. And I think it's just something that will only improve journalism as we're looking at this aspect of people's lives and including it in our reporting. Thank you so much. And, and Becky, uh, uh, if I'm remembering right, there's not very many uh, positions like yours even in the country, right? Not that I know of, I follow um, a handful. Some of them focus more on domestic violence specifically, but yeah, it's not a beat where it's a traditional cops and crime beat that you see at newspapers. Thank you. So Liz, I'd like you to start on this next question. And what I want to really get the, we're, we're gonna dig into some of the research on it and then the application, but to really start us off, I want each of you to take three to five minutes and talk about some of the research or data that you've collected or heard about that you think is most interesting for yourself and for the work that you're doing. Uh, Liz, would you start with that one? Yeah, definitely. It's funny because before we started, we were having a conversation about the data that uh, 2019 and how relevant it is. And I actually, um, thought that I would share a little bit of um, what I find interesting in the well-being of women in Utah in 2019 uh, fact sheet, which is the, the last fact sheet that YWCA in collaboration with the Institute for Women's Policy Research in Washington, D.C. Um, published. And I actually think it's relevant for the exact reasons that we were talking about, uh, and that is how some of the, um, some of the data might look now in light of COVID and the impact it has on 2020. So some interesting highlights um, include uh, the percentage of women in Utah who work outside the home continues to increase. So in our research, uh, which began in a 2014 briefing and, and then we've had follow-ups up to 2019, um, the percentage of women in Utah who work outside the home has increased. And I think that it will be really interesting to see. And I know we'll have that in this conversation today, how that has impacted, how COVID and um, has impacted uh, women's ability to work outside the home and consideration of childcare and other caregiving responsibilities. Um, some other interesting highlights, the percentage of women in Utah working part-time is the highest in the nation. And that definitely has implications again for 2020. As we know that um, part-time work often does not include paid time off um, or any other kind of um, uh, benefits, healthcare benefits and, and that sort of thing. Uh, another highlight, women of color participate in the labor market at higher rates than white women in Utah that have lower earnings. And among full-time uh, year-round workers, white women earn significantly more than women from all other racial and ethnic groups. And I think that that's important when speaking about the gender wage gap, that it is also a gender racial wage gap. Um, and data as of 2018, which is the most recent we have, shows that one in three Utah women experiences violence by an intimate partner in her lifetime. And during COVID, uh, a lot of folks have heard, of course, I've heard in my work that, um, and have seen the increase in, in domestic violence services um, that is perhaps a result of people really having to lock down in their homes that aren't safe for everyone and, and that uh, women are disproportionately impacted by family violence. Um, so those are some, some highlights that I found were interesting from 2019 and I think are particularly interesting when thinking about how they are impacted and might change for 2020. Um, but I did want to mention one other survey or piece of research that I was looking at recently, and that is the Race to Lead Revisited from the Building Move Movement Project and Race to Lead. In 2016, uh, Race to Lead published uh, a report called Women of Color in the Nonprofit Sector. And in 2019, they updated their survey, added some, some new questions, um, included ex experiences with discrimination, workplace dynamics, and compensation. And I think given this uh, moment in our nation's um, sort of racial 
uh, reckoning with racism, the sort of um, racial dynamics that that are really present uh, for all of us right now. And um, given the Black Lives Matter protests, uh, police violence and conversations of anti-Blackness and race equity in the workplace, um, some, of the, some of the data that they pulled out in terms of Black women's experiences, I found personally relevant and I think particularly relevant for everyone. Um, but some highlights are that Black women were the most likely out of other groups of women of color and men of color to say that race and gender had a negative impact on their career advancement. And more Black women said so in the 2019 survey at 59% than in 2016 at 48%. And some of the themes in the qualitative responses from Black women included being confronted with stereotypes and discriminatory comments on the basis of race and or gender and being passed over for new jobs and or overlooked for promotions and experiencing inequitable salaries. So uh, a lot of what came out in the 2016 survey did, hasn't changed, but I think of in light of this moment and this conversation, thinking about the way in which um, some of the challenges in COVID and in an economic turndown um, and in achieving gender equity look different for different categories of women, of course, we'll, women are not homogenous. And I think this study really highlights that. Um, and we have different groups of women have different opportunities and barriers and any discussion about the well-being of women, of course, has to take into account how complicated that that, that all is. Um, and so I wanted to share this report because I felt like that kind of offers, sets the stage of thinking about and having a conversation about the well-being of women that is much more complicated um, and, I, and I know that that's what we're about to have then thinking about women as a homogenous group. Thank you for sharing that. Um, just so those who are listening in and those who are watching uh, will be watching later, we, right after we finish these updates, we're gonna get into a question specifically about COVID-19 and how that may be impacting women um, specifically, even though research is just barely coming out on that, we definitely, are keeping our ear and eyes on the research as well. So Becky, can you share some of the, the research and data? You know, I've, I've been of course in touch with you on the, on the large study that you did a while back that had some fascinating findings. Yeah, that's one of the things I'm most proud of um, that I've been able to accomplish with the Tribune. Because there's all these rankings, like we see from Wallet Hub every year, labeling Utah as the worst for women's equality. And so we decided we really wanted to see how Utah women perceive themselves, which is sometimes really hard to capture. Um, so in November, we, with Suffolk University, we surveyed 400 women across the state, ages 18 and older. Um, and Susan and others helped us write poll questions. Um, that's something at the newspaper we hadn't done before, but it was fascinating. And so from that, we learned that more than half of Utah women said that they definitely or probably believe women in Utah have an overall lower status than men. And we asked them to identify their biggest challenges. They were pretty evenly split about um, what they said the biggest challenges were. They cited low wages and cultural expectations about gender roles. Um, we also went into questions, there's an overwhelming number of Utah women who want to see more women in leadership positions in government in Utah and in business. Um, those numbers were up above 80%. I think that's pretty clear of what they want. We also, of course, asked about the gender wage gap since that comes up so much. Um, and a majority of them in over 75% said they want um, state and local government leaders to work on the wage gap. And even more, 80% said they wanted business leaders to look at the wage gap. So I think that also sends a message that they want our leaders to be working on that in the state. Um, the survey got into more um, details. We talked to women about working part-time. As you mentioned earlier, women work part-time at the highest rate in Utah. And we kind of um, got to look at the answers based on religion and age of women, um, which didn't change it too much, but there are stories on the site that you can see that digs into that more. And another thing I was really excited about is when I started, we talked about how experts in articles and newspapers tend to be men. They're quoted the most. Mm -hmm. And you know, even if you go to women, sometimes they defer to the men and say they're more qualified. So I 
consciously made the effort to quote more women and focus on that in my story, whether they were experts or everyday people. Um, so I, at the end of my first year, I looked over the numbers. I've been tracking in a spreadsheet with each story, if who I spoke with and if they were new. So I interviewed 257 people on just the women's issues beat in my first year. That doesn't include COVID coverage or um, breaking news coverage. 135 of those had never been quoted in the paper before, as far as I could tell. And 118 of those were new female voices and faces. Um, so I was really happy with how that turned out the first year. And I'm still tracking and going to keep going with that as I keep reporting. But um, yeah, those are two things we set out to do this year. And I was really happy with how it turned out. That's, and I'm, that's so great. And I'm glad you're tracking that. Uh, because I think that's important, uh, the people that you quote, um, you know, end up um, being role models in some ways, but, but people look at, at who is quoted, definitely. So that's great. And, and one thing I wanted to highlight in one of the findings that you said, Becky, mm -hmm. was that so many women, 80%, said they wanted to see more women in business and in uh, politics, right? Mm -hmm. Were those the two areas? Yeah, government and business. And if I'm remembering correctly, they were almost as high when you broke them down into all the different religions, right? So yeah. we, for the Latter-day Saint, who's, who, you know, we have so many Latter-day Saints in the state, it was still really high that women who were of that religion said they wanted to see more women in those roles. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what I remember too, is it was just clear across the board they want to see that. Yeah, thank you so much. Robin. I loved hearing uh, what both of you shared. Becky, you're creating your own data. So thank you for that. Thank you for keeping track and, and following that. And, and Liz, I love you drawing attention to the fact that when we talk about women's experiences, there, there's no one woman's experience, right? They, it, we're all so diverse. Um, some of the things that I've been paying most attention to lately, uh, as Susan mentioned, I spent the last five years looking at all topics. I have a very broad, but not very deep uh, knowledge of women's issues, especially in the state of Utah. And one of the things that we find that's a, that's a continual struggle as we're doing our research is I can find national data that includes a gender component. And I can find Utah data that's specific to Utah, but it doesn't break things out by gender. And that's some of what I've been looking at over recent weeks as I've been trying to study and understand how women's labor force participation has been affected here in the state over the last six months with the um, economic depression and all the other, I guess I can't say that word, the economic problems and struggles that we've been having. Becky, I looked back to an, an article that you wrote back in May about how a higher percentage of the unemployment um, applications were coming from women. And that was something that was very interesting to me at the beginning of the downturn about how so many women and particularly women of color, women, lower income women, women from different marginalized groups were more likely to lose their jobs at the beginning because we were coming from positions of, uh, they, were, they were in roles that were heavily affected by the pandemic. But at the same time, we have so many women also who are in essential roles and so their health is at risk. So looking at all of those numbers and trying to understand the way the last six months has, has affected women differently has been really interesting to me. Um, in terms of Utah data specifically, my great friend Mallory Bateman up at the Gardner Institute just put a great dashboard out that is real current. Uh, these are surveys that they're taking every two weeks on the household pulse. And unfortunately, this isn't broken out by gender either, but most households have a woman in them, right? And so there were a lot of interesting uh, data points in that about how many uh, people in the household are worried about losing income over the next month or so. How many uh, people are facing um, issues with childcare? If they have a computer at home, if they have reliable internet at home so their children can be doing their homework. And it really brought to light so many of the issues that are becoming hyper relevant for Utah women right now. And so I, I will share a link to that dashboard. It was really fascinating. But finally, I wanna share some, some exciting news, Susan, about the project that we're working on. On a, We're looking at flexibility and family-friendly policy. So this is new research. It hasn't even been finished yet. It hasn't been reported yet. So you can look out for it in the next month or two. But um, I was really excited and encouraged to see um, how many companies 
have pivoted so well. They, we had an other comment section and so many companies said, we were dead set against working from home. We were dead set against flexibility and things like that. And suddenly we were forced to do it and we've realized we were wrong. And that opens up a whole world of opportunity for women coming down the pipeline, which is one of the most exciting things I could imagine. And so we're really looking at, that's something that I'm gonna be watching very carefully over the next year or two, is how companies make long-term shifts based on something they weren't planning or didn't want, but they've realized it opens new opportunities for them. So that's some research I've been looking at lately. And Robin, you know, I don't know if Liz and Becky know, but uh, 20 years ago, my dissertation was, and I was at the time doing, doing my work in Minnesota, was on teleworking, telecommuting and work and family conflict. That was my main, I was the first one globally to do that research. And then we moved from one of the top states in best places to work for women to Utah and found that actually remote working and, and the family friendly things, we were at least, 10, 15, 20 years behind uh, Minnesota in those things. But it's so fascinating that we've shifted so much by force and how those kinds of things, it'll just be interesting to see how that plays out. So let's shift over now to, and, and you have already talked a little bit about COVID-19, but very specifically, how do you think COVID-19 has affected Utah women? And second, do you think it impacts women more than men? And of course, we're seeing some data coming out. But um, Becky, let's start with you um, and get your perspective. And then Robin, and then Liz, I want you to finish up this conversation. But while I'm thinking about it, I would love to have you also share, because you're, you know, YWCA actually hosts families right there who live. So you, you have had a chance to actually see how that plays out in so many lives. So Becky, start us out on this one. Yeah, it, it's definitely impacting women in Utah and across the country. I mean, you've seen a lot of references to it being this she, I can never say it, she session, um, mm -hmm. you know, of it affecting women. But as Robin mentioned, we reported earlier that um, in the first months of the pandemic, women in Utah were filing more unemployment claims than men. Um, and I think we haven't seen as much Utah specific information on how it's affecting men and women, but nationally, um, the 19th has done a really good job of covering that. And they had this report recently that just, I had to stare at it for a while because they reported that 865,000 women left the workforce in September compared to 216,000 men. Um, it's just such a big gap and they were talking about what are the long-term effects of this on the workforce if women are leaving you know we've made progress in years is it going to go back and then how do you get more women into the leadership positions we've been talking about if they're not there um and i think childcare has been a huge thing too as we're talking about with schools closed or children being home um we've been recording reporting about the child care industry in utah and in March, I wrote a report that even before the pandemic, Utah wasn't meeting the needs of childcare. We were only meeting about a third of the need for childcare in the state. Um, and so luckily there's been updates every day of the numbers of how many childcare um, centers are opened and closed temporarily in Utah. And early on in May, when I started looking at it, we had about 14% of facilities closed. And by now, I just looked this morning, we're about 8%. So you mm -hmm. see it changing and it's been a hard hit on childcare providers, um, but I think it's starting to even out a little bit more, which is good to see, but it's definitely gonna be a long-term effect that we'll have to follow. Thank you so much. Robin, why don't you take it, take it next? You've you worked a little bit into COVID-19 already, but yeah, just move us forward on the research you've been seeing. I feel like it's all I can think about. It's, it's hard to think of, of life before it, right? So um, and, one of the things- Robin, one of the reasons is you still have a bunch of kids in your house. Oh yeah, I like I'm that. living, the, right, right when the pandemic hit, hit back in March, I had nine people in my household living here and, and no one was going anything. We were completely locked out. I'm like, this is too many people in one house, right? <laughs> it's crazy. Um, Susan, the way you phrase the question, is it affecting women more than men? 
uh, I really feel it's affecting women differently. And, and some, some of the things we've seen in early numbers, the deaths were higher among men and different things like that. But I was looking this morning at our Utah data for infection rates and deaths, and we're pretty even, men and women here in the state at this point. But uh, men are feeling different pressures, and boy, are women feeling the pressure here in the state. Um, we have opened our schools more than a lot of other states have nationally, but but it has, and, and I'm so grateful. I would worship at the feet of every public school teacher right now, and, and they are doing a remarkable job. I'm so grateful. But there is still a lot of chaos. I have four kids now at home. I kicked out all my college kids. Luckily, they're back infecting the world with all their horribleness right now. But um, here with my public school kids at home, I've got four kids at home. We've been in school for six weeks, and we have experienced six quarantines in those six weeks among my four kids. I just got a note yesterday that, that my junior high oh. kid just got quarantined again. And he's like, oh, the big harvest festival is tomorrow. He was so bummed. So there are these different, it's, there's so much complexity around what women are having to manage. And so again, uh, Cheryl Sandberg just wrote an article recently called the double double shift. So women are doing their regular double shift, which is working for pay and working for home. And now they're homeschooling children and caring, ca caring for the sick, caring for their elderly relatives in a way that they haven't before. And so these are some of the ways, you know, Susan, you and I did a report years ago on unpaid care work in Utah and how our gap between the amount of work that men is men are doing at home and women doing at home is larger than the national gap, even though there's a gap everywhere in the world. But that has just expanded. And so every everything that that women were already facing, a lot of these challenges that we were already dealing with are, are expanded right now. And there are some new challenges. I mean, never in the world would I ever have ever signed up to homeschool my kids, not in the million universes. And yet I've done it a bunch and, and I can do it and, and we'll figure it out. But there are so many women who can't because they are working in essential fields where they can't they can't do their work at home flexibly like I can, right? They have to be in the doctor's office. They have to be in the factory or else we don't get our toilet paper, right? And so I understand that that it's affecting women differently than men and it is affecting all women differently uh, within the state of Utah, lower income women, women of color, women with um, health issues. There are so many factors we need to look at in understanding how this is affecting Utah women. And so I want to put a shout out to everybody out there who has a million dollars. Give it to Susan so we can start researching and get better numbers to understand what is going on with women here in the state. Yeah, actually, thank you, Robin, for that shout out. Actually, we've had a lot of requests come in recently, and I am in the process of looking for some funding specifically for a really in-depth study on the effects of COVID-19 on Utah women in the workplace, not just women in leadership, although we'll look at that, but also into you know, women of different races, income levels, and try to, to really get in, in rural areas as well. But that's going to take some funding to hire a couple of researchers. And I think Becky, of course, you'd be interested in that. And Liz, it will have a lot of applicability to your, and, and Robin, definitely <laughs> interested in that. Um, so back to you, Liz, or over to you, Liz, for this question. I'm interested in, in the just how, how you've actually seen things impacted. And uh, Becky and Robin, if you haven't already, can you take a look at the chat and see where the questions are going? And then let's take a little bit of break from my question sheet and see what's coming in and, and see what we want to talk about. Um, so Liz. Yeah, I just um, wanted to share one little um, factoid. I don't know if it's an actual fact that I heard um, that uh, during this time of COVID, women are spending 15 hours more a week on um, domestic work uh, and 15 hours um, in comparison with men who are spending, oh, well, actually, I actually have it right here. Um, so women average 65 to 50 hours compared with men who, um, or women 65, men 50 hours compared with the pre-COVID balance of 35 hours of domestic work and men were at 25 hours. So to Robin's point um, and to, in response to your question, Susan, I think that um, clearly COVID impacts us all in different ways, men and women. And um, the domestic work has increased for both men and women. And it has always 
um, primarily been a burden that uh, disproportionately impacted women who carried most of that burden and still does in this time of COVID. Um, and I also wanted just to highlight another thing that Robin pointed out that I just felt was so important. And that is that for many women, white collar women like myself, some of the, the, the changes, the hopefully long-term changes like flexible working and being able to work remote, um, uh, that have come about in response to, to, to figuring out how to work in the time of COVID will benefit women, you know, like myself um, and white collar women. But, but as Robin said, there are uh, lots of women, um, particularly women who um, work in service areas or in essential work who, who won't have that same opportunity, um, but yet still have perhaps the childcare needs. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a, a compounding challenge for them. Um, and then to what Becky said, Childcare is um, such a, such an issue. And as a working mother um, who has had my daycare quarantine, um, and just as a side note, the daycare is actually the YWCA daycare. So also within our organization, we run a community-facing daycare um, that has had to quarantine due to COVID. And that challenge is extreme to be to to have to parent um, a toddler while also needing to work. Uh, and I and I personally also felt that that burden was. Um, that I disproportionately in my own family carried that burden. Um, but to, to your point in terms of the YWCA, we as an organization, we have 225 to 250 women and children who live here every single day. Um, and as those families are working towards securing safe housing and economic opportunities for moving forward, uh, while in the midst of a personal crisis, they are additionally challenged like all of us during this time in the midst of a global crisis. And so um, the women here who have children are primary caregivers. And um, as a staff, we are we also have uh, over 100 staff members, the vast majority of whom are women, many of whom are also the primary caregivers. And so the burden is significant. Um, and I feel that I'm often thinking about it in several different ways. Obviously, on the personal level, I'm thinking about it in terms of the service that we offer our residents, and I'm thinking about it in the way that we attend to um, our staff experience as well. There's this sort of just compounding and compounding, um, and and there's this emotional and mental labor um, that uh, is just incredibly heavy at this time, um, in the midst of a socio-political and cultural environment that is really tense. Um, and I think also very heavy. And so all of those things are, are really complicated. And, um, and I find myself and my leadership team always thinking about how can we rise to this occasion in this moment for both our residents um, and our staff and ourselves? And how can we think cre creatively in attending to the needs? Uh, so as when, when we shut down our daycare for our residents, our residents who are in service industry jobs can't can't go to work because they don't have childcare. Um, and we're trying to think creatively of how, how we attend to that. We don't have all the answers, but I'm, but I am proud of us for keeping that, that, that question really present in the way that we direct our work and our services. And I feel like honestly, month to month, it's constantly changing. And every time we have to quarantine or there's a new COVID case, it's different than the last time um, and presents different challenges. Uh, and it's, just to underline everything, it is really clear to me in my role and in my life at this time that the burden, the child care and the caregiving and domestic work burden that women have on top of um, their, their work and professional careers um, in a time of global crisis, we might say, um, or at least tension uh, is, uh, is significant. And that the, I'm really focused on the mental and emotional well-being because to some degree, that's what we can attend to. Can't change everything, can't change COVID, can't change the election and what's happening in the streets. Um, or maybe we can change it in some ways, but what we have control of today really is our ability um, to think about how we treat each other, how we engage with each other, how we help each other through this moment. That's so great. You know what, while you were talking, I was thinking back to my first couple of books a decade ago where I interviewed 10 of the women governors for one of my books and 10 top university presidents. And they very clearly said some of the biggest growth and development of leadership for them through the years was in times and situations of challenge and how that just 
And I'm thinking about that today in even Robin's pushback about her kids. Well, you're learning how to even multitask better, Robin. You're learning how to how to teach. I know she doesn't look very happy, but but we can't forget in in all of my my being vocal about how do we develop and be better. That's sometimes difficult things. We're going to all learn a lot. Let's just put it that way. We're going to learn a lot for our heads, but also I think our hearts too, and then how to do things differently and more creatively, don't you think? So um, uh, any of you, what's going on in the chat and what do you, would you like to chat about before we get on to my next formal question? I responded to a question in the chat where a woman said that uh, her son truly believes that efforts to advance and support women are sexist. And another woman commented that her mother-in-law feels the same way. And, and I think that's a fascinating conversation. I, I have people in my lives who have some of these same concerns. And I, Susan, I've heard you say this a lot, that even though you support women, you love, that doesn't mean you don't love men. And I've had to do this. I have three daughters and three sons. And I, I have to remind my boys really deliberately now and then, because I'm always focusing on women and girls, I don't want you to think that I don't care about men and boys. They certainly have plenty of their own challenges. And there are other great and wonderful people who are going to work on those issues. But this is where I'm focusing to spend my energy and attention. And, and it's appropriate, even if it's not the exact same, we're not treating it, everyone just the exact same. I, I said that I'd pull up a cartoon on the difference between equity and equality, because it is absolutely appropriate to find ways to support and advance people who have traditionally been suppressed and discouraged and all those other things. So, so that's kind of my thought when I, when I deal with those um, thoughts. Yeah, to, oh, go ahead. <laughs> to jump off um, what Robin was saying, I saw that comment too. And, and that's something that comes up a lot in my beat. There's a lot of men on Twitter and Facebook that like to comment on my articles and say, oh, she's writing about the, the women again. What about the men? You know, they've called me a one trick pony for that's all I write about. And I'm like, that's my beat. Um, but I, you know, it's something I've thought about too. And, and I was at a national journalism conference virtually a couple weeks ago, and I got to listen to Erin Haynes, who is the editor at large of the 19th that I referenced. And I, I posed that question to her, how do you respond to people that criticize you for only reporting about women's issues and things? And she kind of had that like, duh response of why you needed but she pointed out just basically look at the population of the country and do you see how many women there are compared to men it's a huge chunk of the population and it's something that needs to be reported on um and i saw another question in the chat just about childcare, and they say that they're looking at solutions and you know what has been tried before and um what is there also to look at the people I really rely on, I look at YWCA Utah's policy initiatives each year. Um, they address that a lot and um, Voices for Utah Children. But just one example of last session that we wrote a story about was Representative Suzanne Harrison proposed a couple bills to give tax credits or tax incentives for um, having more childcare options for people. And, and really the hearing just kind of devolved into people not quite grasping the concept and kind of talking over each other, not really understanding it. So I think there's a lot more discussion to be had and I'm really curious how those conversations are gonna change with this next session as it's talked about a little bit more with COVID this year and if it will change. So I've heard Becky and you and all of us have probably heard, especially from legislators that why do we need to have public policy around childcare? Because it's a family issue, it's a personal issue, and they, it shouldn't be a public issue. Um, but what we know is that it is a public issue. And some of the states doing the best in terms of the economy and, and just economic development really are looking at that as a public issue and not just a family issue. And, and of course, you know, there's an assumption that all families are the same and there's two parents in the household and all of these things. Um, but what's fascinating about the research that we've done, and by the way, Robin and I have published a whole series of snapshots. Child care is one, unpaid care work, the gender wage gap, mental health, sexual harassment, you know, sexual assault, poverty, domestic violence, all kinds of things. If you, if those of you listening are not aware of those resources, those are pretty powerful resources um, that are available online. So um, Liz, any comments from the chat that you 
highlighted or would like to highlight? Yeah, I um, actually just had two comments in relation to the child care and, and also the why women question. Um, but for child care, just to your point, Susan, it, um, and to Becky's, I think it is a public issue and, and something that hopefully we will continue to see um, explored at uh, during our legislative session because um, the model for private child care just really isn't sustainable. The, the program that we have at the Y that is community facing is exactly that model. So we don't have, it's not a public private um, partnership. And because of that, in light of COVID, I mean, always it's, it's a really fine line between having, um, uh, and it's in childcare, as someone said in the, the chat is expensive, but it's also because we're trying to provide a good work experience for our teachers, which means benefits and pay time off and all of that is that overhead is quite expensive and childcare just does not bring in enough. Um, and so we're just really year to year just trying to break even and then COVID happens. And we have been lucky enough to receive support from the Office of Child Care Licensing through the CARES Act, but without that, it would have been um, just uh, like many, like like the the stat that Becky gave. We, we we may have had to make some hard decisions of whether or not we could remain open, um, and we have been able to remain open because we've received some of those public funds. So I think that, that really highlights that there needs to be a partnership. Um, and then in terms of why women, I just this is an interesting question. I know that we have all um, gotten it a lot, and I think Becky and Robin both answered it really well. And what I would just add is that. Um, that when, we're, when we do focus our efforts on improving the well-being of any group of people in our society, again, I truly believe that it improves the well-being of our entire society, the overall health of all of our society. So um, although we're talking about women here, we're working on women's well-being, that in doing so, it also improves our communities and this, the, the well-being of every member of our state, men and boys included. And so um, that's what I would offer to that conversation. Thank you. Um, and you know what, I loved what you just said. I talk about this a lot. When you, you know, the, Robin and I have talked for years about, we, we just see this zero sum mentality a lot. Like if, if you're, you know, gonna lift women, then men were taking them down. And, and that is just not the case. It's not either or. You can lift women and families and men and everything at the same time. And so that's one of the the comments I want to make. And one of the other things that came to mind uh, based on what you were talking about um, is um, in terms of childcare, when Robin and I were working on the childcare report, we were like, oh my gosh, this is so interesting because childcare is so expensive, yet, do you remember this, Robin? It's so expensive, yet the people that, that run child cares are living in poverty. So there's something in the middle that has to happen with public policy and support. So there's this real interesting tension there. So let's shift. Susan, can, I just, oh, can, sure. I just, can I just piggyback on that a little bit? That's one of the main things that came away. And, and Liz, you just talked about this. The child care issue cannot be purely a market driven solution. It, 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 it's not sustainable. There needs to be more things going on. And one of the things that has been so clearly um, exposed throughout this pandemic is that the United States workforce, much more than so in other countries, has been built upon the backs of women doing unpaid work or very low paid work. And so when that was no longer possible because of all these different restrictions, then we've realized we have serious holes in our infrastructure that we need to find different ways to fill other than having women have to work 20 hours a day for little or no pay in order to even survive. So that, that was really brought to light because of this. It, we already all knew it, but it's been highlighted in ways that never has been before. Thank you, Robin, I appreciate that. So I want to move over into, and we're talking about some of them now, but what are the risks or threats to women in the state that you really have some of your most concerns about? You know, understanding the research, uh, the research, seeing the stories, Becky, seeing the people on the ground list that you do. I mean, what are the things that just you have most concern about? Any of the issues that we've talked about or any others in the state? Um, let's start with Robin on this and then go to Liz. 
Okay, I'm gonna actually gonna go to my sheet because I pulled up a bunch of stats. And uh, Becky, you already talked about one of these about the more than 800,000 women who left the workforce last year versus, I mean, last month versus 200,000 men. So four times as many women. Uh, one in four women are considering either downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce entirely. One in three mothers are considering that. Um, and then I, I just wanted to actually, Susan, if I can, if I can get back here, I just wanted to share my screen for a second and show this kind of scary graph that my friend sent me last night and it, and it is those numbers, but you can see this. Look at what happened. We're, we're tracking women lost more jobs at the beginning coming back and then we get here and in August and September when school started, men really rebounded and women jobs dropped. And so this is a this is a huge issue that we're seeing. I wanted to highlight something else that, that I've come up in our anecdotal work that we've been doing. I am launching a program right now with my uh, team at Rise Next, which is helping women get into different types of careers launching into the tech industry. And as we were doing our interviews at the beginning of the fall, we talked to a number of women who were facing this really difficult dilemma. They had not been laid off because their employers had taken federal funds that uh, precluded them from doing a certain amount of layoffs, but their hours had been reduced so much that they could not support their families. And so they were in a catch 22. They couldn't apply for unemployment themselves because they still had a job, but their hours were too low to support. Now, the good news is they came and found us and we're doing some retraining and we're gonna find them better jobs with more opportunity in the long term. But these are some of the things that, that women are facing that are different that we felt before. But um, Somebody in the chat talked about part-time work and, and what's wrong with part-time work and dealing with that as an answer to the childcare issue. I'm actually a huge proponent of part-time work for women when it's the right thing for them. And a lot of women it is. And, I, and the problem, the thing that's wrong with it is too many companies don't provide opportunities for women to do uh, fulfilling and well-paid part-time work. If they did, more women could do it. But there are also many women who either don't want to, they, they want to be working full-time or cannot afford to. And so part-time work can be part of the solution. And I hope that it is when it works for certain women, but it cannot be the entire solution. So, so looking at the huge loss of women out of the workforce, the fear that we are going to lose so many of the gains that we've made. I, I pulled up another article last night that said that while working from home, fathers were three times more likely than mothers to receive a promotion and two times more likely than mothers to receive a raise. So again, this is exacerbating the distinctions that we already had between the men and women, the advantages that so many men have because so much of the unpaid work is going on women. So lots of things to talk about, lots of challenges. I'm excited to talk about solutions too. Yeah, exactly. Liz. So um, I, I sort of just jotted down a list real quick um, of what came to the top of my mind and, it, and it, a lot of things came to the top of my mind, um, but access to health care, um, including mental health care. And I was just reading in the chat um, where someone asked a question, how do we care for ourselves? And I think that's such an important part of, of um, how we rise to this occasion, attend to each other um, and to ourselves. Um, and so access to healthcare, access to mental health care, the full spectrum of reproductive health care, um, it seems in one way or another, it's always up for debate during our legislative session, some form of health care or reproductive health care, um, but also that's connected to maternal mental health and maternal mortality rates, particularly for women of color. Um, we, we talked a bit about, touched on the gender um, uh, and racial wage gap. Um, so I think that that that's definitely a risk. And I know that that's one that you've also been working on. Um, and again, I, I also have on my, my list access to affordable childcare. Um, uh, I think race equity and uh, the way we see the impact of racism bear out and poor health and economic outcomes for women and their families, violence against women, sexual assault, sexual violence against women, it's also at epidemic rates and has been, right? Um, and when we consider the, those numbers and, 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 you know, in some sort of comparison to COVID and the type of uh, response and creativity, creativity solutions that we um, come up with as a community and as organizations to address uh, COVID, I think that there is, that shows that we have the ability um, to do the same when it comes to violence against women, which is also an epidemic. Um, and then another, my last risk um, threat was 
um, not enough women in office. And um, clearly Becky talked about this as well, but not just office, but decision-making roles and managerial leadership roles. Um, I, I think that for women's needs and issues uh, to be at the forefront and be effectively addressed, women need to be a part of those conversations. And as we talked about a lot today, it's not, and it's not, it's not just about having a token women because women are diverse. So it's about having a diverse and fair representation of the diversity of women. Not all women agree with each other or agree on the right way forward, but having more voices at the table to share more experiences in our community will mean that our policies, our practices, the way that we um, structure our organizations will hopefully um, be responsive to more people. Yeah, I love that. And Becky, any final thoughts on this? And then we'll shift to some of the talking about some of our positive history and where we're at today and in some of the leadership roles. But anything you would like to share on risks and threats and some of your biggest concerns? I sign on to everything that Liz and Robin said. I think they summed it up really well. Just a couple things to add. The maternal anxiety piece is really, or maternal mental health piece is really interesting. Um, I reported, it feels like a year ago now, but I think it's only been a few months about um, the maternal anxiety rate in Utah has doubled in recent years and they're not quite sure why yet. And so they're starting to look into that. And I think that'll be an interesting thing to play out and keep following with. And I agree with the idea of the effects on the workforce and the gender wage gap and childcare. And I'm, I keep saying this, but I'm really interested how this next session plays out and how it plays in. Um, I think something I'm gonna be curious at looking at as we talk about women and representation and at the table making the decisions is that, you know, if you look over at Nevada, they have, I think the last number I saw is 54% women in their state legislature, which is huge. Um, and I'm really curious to see what kind of policies and um, changes come out from them and looking at that compared to legislatures where there's more men in there, not to say that they can't handle these issues, but I think it'll be interesting to see how having more women's voices at the table will affect how people go forward. I love that. Yeah, that'll be interesting to compare. So let's switch gears and talk about our context. So Utah has such a wonderful history and that 2020 is a big year for the you know, celebration, various celebrations, um, and it, particularly around women. But considering our rich history and our culture, even though it was 100 years ago or so, um, and that we do have some great women leading in business, nonprofits, not enough like you talked about, but we do have some great women leading. What are some of your thoughts about that, about the context and that we do seem to have more women, um, at least than in past, recent past decades leading? Just what are your thoughts? Are you optimistic? Are you, um, yeah, some of your thoughts. Uh, let's start with Liz on this one. Yeah, I, I feel really optimistic. I mean, I, this is a great question that um, brings a smile to my face and made me feel really excited because I have the privilege of leading an organization where I am surrounded by so many amazing women doing incredible things from the women who access our services to um, our staff, uh, to our board. Uh, it's so many women who are trying to make a positive change in their own lives, in their families' lives, in their community, in our state. Um, and then I also get to engage with so many partners like all of you on this panel and every, everybody who showed up to, to hear this conversation um, who are part of that work. And uh, I, as you said, Susan, Utah has so many examples of talented, smart, creative, expert women leaders. And I think that women in Utah are making moves full speed ahead I don't think that those moves are fully captured in the stats that we see in Wallet Hub or in um, the Institute for Women, um, Women's Policy Research or other rankings and data, but I have high hopes. I'm absolutely optimistic that the work we are all now putting in will bear fruit and perhaps in the next generation, we'll see, um, we'll see some shifts happening um, and it will be because of the seeds that were planted before us and the soil that we continue to cultivate. Um, so I, I feel really hopeful. I think that we are, I, I just, I feel great about our state and the women in our state. So um, I'm certain that we're on the right track. 
And Liz, why don't you, I had a question, a few questions from now, but why don't you just share maybe a couple things on as you look at some opportunities in the next year or so for, for girls and women, what, what do you see? What do you see? Yeah, so I, I think Robin mentioned this a little bit, and I don't know if she's going to speak more to it, but I think that STEM is, is a great opportunity. For me personally, um, in my own personal story, education was, was a pathway out of poverty for me. And I know that I recognize that that isn't perhaps the right fit for everyone, and it is expensive, and there are lots of barriers. But I think for many, it can be, and that STEM is this like opportunity that is just burgeoning and will be around for a while, and that perhaps has some flexibility and career growth and all of those things. And there's lots of programs out there. Um, I have looked at some of them for the YWCA and the way that we can mentor and get young girls involved in STEM. Um, fields. So um, I think that that is definitely an opportunity. But and I also think that sort of what we're doing here, thinking about um, thinking about our moves as women in this state and how we can mentor younger women um, who are who who are coming up um, and who want to be engaged and involved and find their own path and, and contribute to this work as well. So I think mentoring and then continued collaboration. There are so many of us doing so much work and we are going to be not only more powerful, but more efficient and effective with our time and our energy when we collaborate and work together. And I think that women in Utah in particular do that really well. Yeah, I love that. So Becky, I piled two questions on you. One is a bad reminder, just let's talk about the context, great history, what's going there now, and then some of the opportunities you see. Yeah, one of the best parts of my job is I get to talk to all these leading women in Utah who are working to make change. Um, and every time I feel like the, the the interview turns into a conversation where we just keep going. And at the end, we kind of sigh and realize there's a lot of work to do, but it's really exciting. And there are a lot of women doing it. Um, I think something that we really tried to do at the TRIB this year is of highlighting this history in Utah and the suffrage anniversaries was really provide context. Because um, I think it, it kind of gets touted a bit that, yay, Utah was great for women, no problems then. And, um, you know, we got some things now, but I think it's just as complicated back then as it is now. Um, and so we really tried to do that, like talking about 1870, when Utah women first got the right to vote, it wasn't fully that it was just, um, you know, like, this is the right thing to do for women and equality, but it was really linked to the debate on polygamy and whether Utah was going to uphold polygamy and have votes with women coming on. And then when Utah women lost that vote in 1887 as part of federal polygamy legislation, they fought for it to come back um, when Utah became a state in 1896. And they really made sure that suffrage was included in the state constitution. Susan B. Anthony told them, like, you better get this done because it is harder to add it later. And it, it was really tied to the debate about statehood. Utah had tried many times to become a state and had some troubles with that. And so they were worried about risking it again by including suffrage. So that debate really played in. And some of the other context we tried to give was these early suffrage anniversaries, whether it's 1870 or 1920 with the 19th Amendment, that was largely limited to white women. Um, and we tried to point that out in every story and highlight the women of color in Utah who fought for suffrage, even though they didn't know when they were going to get it themselves. Um, I think that's really important to include and also we, we pull out Martha Hughes Cannon a lot, which is great. She's the first female state senator, was elected in 1896. And I think that's kind of what we know about her. We just bring out her name. So in a story on Sunday, we really tried to give context to that um, and explain kind of when you take her off her pedestal and she has great accolades, but when you learn about her life and she dealt with success and love and depression and, and disappointment, you really feel how relevant she is to women's lives today. Um, of, you know, like it was having her third child derailed her political career. She was considered as a potential US Senator and Utah still has never had a female US Senator. Um, so I think it's important to highlight these accomplishments, but understand the context and how nuanced it was then just like today. And that there are so many factors that go into all these issues. Thank you so much. Robin, I'll shift it over to you. And then, and then after you speak, 
I want to, in our last uh, 10 minutes or so, I really want to go to um, some solutions, right? Some possible public policies, some some resources that are out there and where we can go to learn more and some of those things. So Robin, wrap, wrap us up on, on this uh, question or the combination of two questions I put up there. Oh, you're, you're, um, you're, you're, <laughs> unmute Robin. <laughs> there you go. I was so excited about my visual aid, I forgot to unmute. So if you guys haven't seen these, these are the Better Days 2020 women's trading cards. They have a bunch of them. If you don't have these, go buy them. I am not getting a commission, but they are amazing. I gave them to all my kids' teachers. I gave them to all of my siblings. So when the pandemic first hit and we were able to have family dinner for the first time in like 15 years, because I have so many kids playing soccer and volleyball and all that other garbage, we sat down every night and we did one of these cards at dinner. And we learned about a fantastic woman in Utah's history. And then let me tell you the amazing thing that happened. My awesome nephew and my kids got together for my birthday and they made me a woman's history trading card. And they said, here's a great woman in Utah's history. And they had my, they have a little quote across the top. And my quote was, I'm cracking skulls. Cause when my kids are acting out, I say, if I find any dirty clothes in the clean, if I find any clean clothes in the dirty laundry basket, I'm cracking skulls. So you can get these on the Better Days 2020 website. We've got a question in the chat. But anyway, the reason why I tell that story to say one nice thing about my kids, because usually I'm saying rotten things about them, but she they loves were, them. She I do loves love them. them. <laughs> but they were able to translate what they were hearing about amazing women in our history and recognize there are amazing women in my life. And so the power that comes from us elevating women's voices and, and the Better Days 2020 has women of color. They have women from different backgrounds, different nations who um, are whose stories have not been told. And there are many, many more. But as we do that, as we share and magnify those stories, then it it just raises everybody up and it gives our young people the opportunity to recognize uh, women are amazing. They, they have so much to offer and they can see the own women, the women in their own lives. The other day we were talking about, um, I, I just was musing out loud and I said, oh, this would be if, if uh, Biden wins, this will be the first time we've had a woman vice president. And my little 11 year old was like, really? She just couldn't believe it, right? And she said the same thing five years ago when I said, we've never had a woman president. She just couldn't believe it because she sees so many strong, powerful women around her that she has a hard time understanding the glass ceiling and all these other systemic inequities that we face for so long. So I, I love the idea of sharing these stories. Becky, what you're doing by normalizing and, uh, and elevating more voices is so fantastic. So when it comes to, what are we talking about next? I should stop <laughs> and let somebody else talk because I talk. <laughs> Okay, Robin, thank you. I've Robin and I have worked together for many years, and I always laugh when she gets going on on her rampage, and and her kids know that, that she loves them, but she she cracks me up. So now I want to really move in our last few minutes here. Um, I want to move to moving forward. So two things. One is what can leaders do? I mean, or what can people that want to make change do, and what even public policy. So the do part, but also where can community members go if they want to be more engaged? So what they, can they do? Where can they go? Kind of lumping that both together. And Liz, let's uh, start with you. And uh, oh, I think we were in that order last time. Maybe Becky. Let's start with Becky and then Robin, then Liz. We'll end with that. How about that? <laughs> that works. Um... To start of where are places to go to get involved to learn more um, Two of my biggest resources are right here on this call I go to the Utah Women in Leadership Project and the YWCA Utah like every day reading their well being report or other reports or policy. Um, I also welcome people to reach out to me for stories if you think there's something we should be covering or things we should be looking at or you just want to share your story reach out. Um, but one thing for something to work on going forward um, that I found interesting is it, we always talk about the gender wage gap. There was a Utah Advisory Committee to the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, and they specifically studied the gender wage gap in Utah, and they just released their report this summer. Um, it kind of got 
lost in all the craziness of COVID and the election and everything, but they gave six bullet points for the state legislature to look at to try to, they told them to strongly consider this. Um, so I think they're kind of nudging them, but it, it, they recommended things that you hear experts and people that research this talk about all the time. Um, ban salary history, eliminate pay secrecy, raise the minimum wage, eliminate the sub-minimum wage, provide mandatory paid parental leave. And then the other thing is just to do a study of the gender wage gap and make sure you include race in that study. Senator Escamilla has tried um, multiple times to get funding for a study to look just at the state employees with the gender wage gap. And it's been shut down a lot. You know, it's something she keeps trying. But both gubernatorial candidates with um, Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox and University Professor Chris Peterson have both said that they support the state employee survey to look at the gender wage gap. And their running mates, Deidre Henderson and Karina Brown, both support that too. So I really wanna see if them being on board will help. I think as you know, Susan and Robin say all the time, looking at our numbers and knowing where we are is how you start. And I think it would be really helpful to have that study to take a, a strong step in that direction. And we will hold them to it. <laughs> right? I'll be asking. <laughs> so, uh, Robin, what are your what is your what are your thoughts? I guess with, with these. In terms of in terms of ways for people on this call to get involved, I would absolutely echo what Becky said. Susan, you've got on your website a list of all the women's resources, uh, women's networking and groups within the state. So if you want to get involved with helping support women and girls, there's no better place to go look. And whatever you're passionate about, whatever you're interested in, whatever your favorite cause is, uh, related to women, you can find the people who are already doing that work and getting involved. Now, in terms of public policy, I will I will leave most of the substance to Liz, because I know that you're the organization in the state that's got a person devoted just to women's public policy, which is just amazing. But I want to just um, emphasize and plead with our leaders, with our elected leaders, to shut their mouths and open their ears and listen to women that somebody shared the video of that session on childcare last year and it really was it was just unbelievable how how close-minded and unwilling to listen to somebody else's ideas some of our state legislators were yesterday i had the privilege of listening to representative hollands talk about how she is a fierce advocate and and the conscience of this um, legislature. And she says, I won't stop talking until somebody listens to what I have to say. And so that's that's the way we can get involved. I'll, I'll give it a plug for the YWCA policy tracker that I love getting their notification saying, this important bill is coming up. Write to your legislator right now and tell them that you support this bill. So that's the way we can get involved and encourage our elected leaders to listen to the women who know what they're talking about and know what we need in the state of Utah. Thank you so much, Robin. And Liz, can you finish it off for us? Yeah, so um, in terms of policy, uh, I will just lift up again what, what um, Robin has shared. We have, we, we have a public policy program here at the YWCA and we have three uh, policy priority areas. Um, empowerment and economic advancement for women and girls, racial justice and civil rights for women and girls of color, and health and safety for women and girls. And so those are our priorities and what lead our work during the session. Um, and we have a, um, a, a, a list serve that you can sign up and get, get updates on our uh, policy work called YW Connect, and you can sign up on our website. Um, and like Robin shared, we have a bill tracker. So depending on what shows up um, at the session, um, that really will um, guide how we, how we approach our work, what, where we support and not don't support bills. Um, but we are really focused on and have been um, maternal mental health, as well as childcare, family leave policies. And I am really hoping to see some of that in light of COVID and the challenges we've talked about in this past hour, um, some of that addressed the wage, wage gap as Becky shared um, in our next uh, session, this starting this January, 2020. Um, and in terms of engagement, again, I would second what Becky and um, Robin have shared um, there. Um, and, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to talk a little bit more about our programs um, and uh, at the YWCA. So we have uh, someone in the chat asked about mentorship opportunities. Um, and we have two 
two programs here for young women's leadership development, Young Women Empowered and Young Women's Council. So first, Women Enter, uh, Young Women Empowered, it's a year-long professional leadership development program, and then after which they receive an invitation to Young Women's Council, which is um, an active group of young women volunteers who participate in service and advocacy, and we are currently uh, accepting applications for that year-long program. Um, and in the Young Women's Council, we have a mentorship program, so older or uh, more seasoned women um, professionals will mentor um, women who are just uh, at the start of their career and, and getting engaged. We also have Real Women Run, which I, I think I briefly mentioned, but it's a collaborative nonpartisan initiative to empower women to participate in public and civic life and to get elected to political office as well as appointments and boards and, leader and commissions. Um, and then, can, yeah. can I just say, yeah, we're going to be, I'm on the board of Real Women Run. And mm -hmm. we'll be doing um, monthly webinars moving forward. We'll have have that information out soon, probably probably maybe an hour or two each um, to really give very specific guidance on how to run for office, how to mark, how to raise money, how to do various things related to office, running for office, and how to get involved in campaigns to support other folks as well. Yeah, and I think even if you feel like you're not running for office isn't your thing, um, there is something that you can gain from what Real Women Run. I think um, not only the information about how to engage in public office, but there are opportunities to, to be appointed and to join boards and commissions. Um, and it's a great opportunity to network. And you never know how, hang, you know, who your neighbor, your sister, your, um, uh, you know, friend who does, who is maybe interested in, and you can be a resource for them. But I think that that's um, a powerful group of women who are working really hard to make change in our community. Thank you. Thanks so much to all of you. Um, I, I really want to thank each of the panelists, uh, Liz and Becky and Robin for your expertise and, and on the resources and the research. Thanks to all of those. There's most of you have hung on for our workshop. Um, all of the panelists are all of the people attending today. Thanks again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.